Recently, we had an in-depth view of the Ryzen 7 600X, an amazing CPU, great at games, surprisingly good at hard tasks, looks like a water strider, just overall a great step forward compared to the previous generation. However, something we did not touch upon was the fact that the 30% performance increase also came with a TDP increase from 65 to 105 watts. Now, upon first inspection, this doesn't really seem like a big concern. After all, there are many 105 watts CPUs out there, the 5800X for example, but in addition to the heat upgrade, the new entry level or mid-tier level, whatever you want to call it, does not come with a shiny piece of aluminum tuned with some of that fancy plastic. Ignoring the countless amounts of mimimi you can read about this topic, the 5800X did not come with a cooler either. And that wasn't because AMD tried to be Apple, but because the rough stealth that came with the 5600X would have never been able to keep that thing cool, heck, not even the 5700X. 700X came with a cooler. So there you already have the actual reason why a 7600X does not come with a cooler. Not because they wanted to do it, but because they needed to do it. Look at it this way. AMD had two possibilities. They could either create a cooler which would be powerful enough to keep this CPU from thermal throttling, even if you install it into a shoe carton, which then just translates into drastical price increase. New cooler, new and bigger packaging, more expensive shipping, and so on and so forth. Forth. Or they just don't and they leave the old price tag on. And let's be honest, the uproar of not including a piece of accessory anymore is smaller than one caused by a price increase. Just look at Apple, they are switching between the two possibilities every year. But hey, at least the old cooler still fits. <laughs> That's something. No matter if you like it or not, once you have the chip, you gotta keep it cool. And that is exactly what we are going to do today. Answer the question, how much cooling do you actually need and no, just because your last CPU was rated at 105 TDP does not always mean that your cooler will also be able to keep a 7600X cool. And all of that is thanks to the definition of TDP, which is merely a suggestion. Just look at the 12900K, 125 watts TDP. That's, that's a joke. Okay, before we begin, a few important things, starting with the CPU itself. Until now, for Ryzen CPUs, the rule of temperature was pretty simple. TJ Maxx, or the maximum safe temperature, was at 95 degrees C. And at that point, the CPU was thermal throttling so hard, minesweepers started to stutter. So the rule was everything underneath 90 was survivable, 80 is a lot better, and 70 is good. Of course, under load, and depending on the exact CPU, you could never be able to stay underneath 70 on low that was just impossible but anyway for many many years we just needed to stay away from that devil's number 95. For the Ryzen 7000 however this is not the case anymore. The new TJ Maxx is not done it is actually a safe operational temperature. As stated many many times by AMD you can run a 7000 chip at 95 degrees C 24 7 and nothing will happen. The power management system is designed by intention to do that, especially on the higher core count chips. That being said, I wouldn't do it. Um, or at least I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you to grab a cooler that cannot keep the CPU lower than 95 on the load. Hey, if your cooler can do that while spinning at half speed, great, great. AMD intentionally did it that way and your fan will not annoy you. And if you would really want to, you could always get it cooled down a bit more, so great. But where is that line? Which coolers are good enough for a 7600X and which one are not? This is our CPU cooler performance benchmark list. This is how cool each of these coolers can get my 3900X while the fans are spinning at 100% of their max speed. While performing this benchmark, the 3900X is pushing about 130 watts. But wait, do not assume that every cooler on this list that can keep a 3900X cool at 130 watts would automatically be enough for the 105 watts of the 7600X. Unfortunately, it does not work this way. Try looking at it this way. If you have a cooler A that can cool down up to 200 watts and a cooler B that can cool down up to 150 watts, there is absolutely no guarantee that the 100 watts load cooler B would be better. We had plenty of coolers that proved to be a lot more more efficient at lower temperatures compared to bigger behemoths. And besides that, 
The CPUs are also not the same anymore. Some may have their hotspots totally centered, others may have it slightly on the right, others can distribute the heat very very well over the IHS and others just don't. And also keep in mind how the IHS on a 7600X looks like. That water strider looks nothing like what we had until now. So no, as far as coolers are concerned, never assume anything without having, having like a comparison value from where you can derive your CPU. You can assume wrong. However, if you take a list like this and you know that on each test we are pushing about 130 watts and let's say that we know that this, this and this cooler can keep a CPU X cool but this cannot, well then we can start to assume stuff because we've got an actually comparable value. If we know that these three can do it, it's pretty sure that this one can too. Maybe it will be a bit better than the one above it or it will be worse than the one below it. Those possibilities come from the differences created by other levels of heat or being not identical or a million reasons. So the goal for today's video is essentially to create hooks because none of the values on this graph apply to a 7600X. So we remove them. However, their relation to one another in a sense of performance difference will remain somewhat the same. So for now, we are going to pick and choose a bunch of coolers from that list and we will slowly create an estimation which will end up with a very straight line and everything above that line is okay and everything below it is not okay. So let's start. I already handpicked a lot of coolers which are sitting like here on the floor right now. Some Arctic, some Be Quiet, Exilence, Noctua and Scythe. And let's not forget that AMD Roth cooler that everybody is whining about. Yeah, I, I tried it and using CPU-Z it hit 110 degrees within a minute and then the PC to shut down. So no, let's get to the real deal. Starting off with water coolers. I wanted to start off strong so I picked up an Arctic Liquid Freezer 420 and yes, the P14s on there are definitely original. This is how Arctic designed it. I did not just slap three P14s in, in white on it because it was actually a ARGB version and I wanted it to be not RGB. It's, no, no, this is original. The liquid freezer stayed at a snuggling 78 degrees C. Barely Arctic, barely, but you made it onto the yes list. This is the yes list. Oh, and I do not yet have the 420 liquid freezer video, so it's not on the list yet, but let's pretend like it is. It, it's not like we all know where exactly it will be positioned in the end. From here, we wanted to slowly travel down the road. Luckily, we have all available Arctic liquid freezers, so we could slowly test each of them one by one and see how they perform. So far, so oh, this is oh, this is heavy. This wasn't a good idea. Yes, this this worked. So far, so good. At this point, we already at least know that everything in between here and here will be able to keep a 7600X cool. But before we jump shit, we also included an Arctic Freezer 30 for eSports Duo in our testing, just to be sure how air coolers would work. Okay, with Arctic done, let's get to Noctua. Of course, we started off with the biggest and baddest NHD15, which I do not have here because uh, it's sitting in my editing rig and cooling down my uncoolable 12900K. So, uh, and I will not rip it out now. It's, it's, no, it will stay in there now. Uh, so, uh, we will just pretend like it's here. Wrong side. Yeah. Going deeper and deeper, everything was going fine until. Our first problematic candidate. Although the U9S did not allow the 7600X to get up to that 95 degrees C, and although the 7600X is built to work on that level, I would still like to see some sort of headroom. Under normal circumstances, you could let this one spin a tiny bit slower, but once summer comes back again and your room gets filled with 30 degrees C air, there is nothing the small U9S could do to keep a 7600X from turning into flames and ashes. So in order to take headroom into account, every cooler that cannot keep the Ryzen underneath 90 degrees C under full load 
is not enough. The noblest. Bad cooler. Bad cooler. The only issue now is that the U9S never made it onto the list of my 3900X, so I still have like no stop line. Damn it. Coming to house, be quiet. Although the Dark Rock Pro 4 did do it, the Pure Rock 2 ran into some issues. Ah, finally I can draw a red line. So at this point we have the reason to assume that everything above this line will probably be a no-go. This means no Arctic A13X, no Montag Air 210, no Aza Blizzard 120, oh thank god that thing was, was, was so awful. Silence, which managed to pull it off too, and surprisingly good, like ignoring the overkill of slapping a oversized red onto a mid-tier CPU, it was the best performing air cooler, which is okay. This did the best job until now. And the Mugen 2. So far so good. Ooh, ooh, it seems like the Dark Rock Slim did not have any luck either. And this not only significantly restricts our list of potential coolers, but at the same time, it kind of finishes our list. Now we can say that everything like a Scythe Mugen 5 Ref C, Dark Rock Pro 4 and above are definitely okay, and everything below a Dark Rock Slim like Hikuga Aqua and Alpenfin Broken 3 and so on, all of those are a definite no. For the ones in between, like an Arctic A35, Shadow Rock 3, well, those are starting to be okay. They will be at the upper limit, but not thermal throttling it though. And this concludes our list. Now we know what cooler we can go for and which one we should definitely avoid if we don't want to test if a 24-7 TJ Maxx is really as much 24-7 as AMD claims. However, nevertheless, sometimes it's good to be safe than sorry. And sometimes, like for example a Xilence M705, would be a safe bet. It's not nearly as expensive as, as a NHD15, yet it can get the job done and it's very good at it. On an extra side note, I also wanted to see if uh, we can do SFF builds. Yeah, we, we cannot. Uh, or at least not with the L9X65, which is the best SFF cooler I have right now, as it, it will thermal throttle really, really quickly, so no. I, but I will keep looking for a solution. And at some point I kind of forgot my favorite cooler, the Noxia U12A. Like, poor guy was standing at the floor. But yeah, now you know what you need to do in order to keep a 7600X cool. I hope you enjoyed the video, but from a side note, we still have a Discord server and it starts to fill up pretty well. So if you want to join, I will leave the links in the description below. Anyway, thank you for watching and hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye.